Welcome to a special MIS TV episode. We are here at the Architectural Center of Vienna that held its 20th Architectural Congress in November 2016. While the Congress was focusing on the development of architecture in the last decades, we seized the opportunity to talk to international participants about their personal history on becoming an architect. Uh, who are you and what do you and your office stand for? <laughs> I'm Wolf Briggs and uh, the studio is called Coop Himmelblau. And actually it's Coop Himmelbau because we, uh, since 15 years we started to build and now we are building big projects but never ever lost the idea of um, our resources, namely we are doing kind of other architecture. What is other architecture? Yes. Wer ich bin? Ich bin 78 Jahre alt. Vor zehn Jahren ist mein Büro bankrott gegangen mit der großen Krise 2008. Und ich bin eigentlich zutiefst getroffen, dass seit dieser Zeit niemand mehr von mir irgendetwas Planerisches abgefordert hat. Weder ein Haus, ein kleines, ein großes, weder ein Städtebau, groß oder klein, nichts mehr. Und ich hatte das, das persönliche Glück, dass ich mein Leben lang parallel zu meiner Architektur und zu meinem Städtebau immer bildnerisch, bildhauerisch tätig war. Und nun kann ich fulltime bildhauern. Und das ist eine große Beglückung. Uh, I am Jean-Philippe Vassal. Uh, my office is Lacaton and Vassal. Lac Anne Lacaton is my partner. Uh, we are established in uh, Paris and we, we are architects um, yeah. and interested in, uh, in space, in people, in life and in freedom. I'm Anna Heringer and for me architecture is a tool to improve lives. I'm uh, from Romania. I'm an architect. I'm uh, trained as an architect in the School of Architecture in Bucharest, which was the uh, only school in Romania till uh, the 90s. And um, I teach. I'm Vedran Mimic. I'm a Croatian born Dutch educator, now working in Chicago at IIT as associate dean for research. I do not run an office, I do run architectural schools. My name is Nathalie de Vries, I'm one of the members of MVRDV and we like to make buildings that deal with the contemporary urban condition and we also like to think about each commission new again. No, I'm Dietmar Stein and I'm the founding director of the Architectural Center in Vienna. Um, it was just by chance, I was asked uh, beginning of the 90s by the politicians to uh, establish and lead uh, such an institution and it was uh, at the beginning uh, was the intention to have a kind of forum for architecture, for contemporary architecture more or less. And when you were studying um, and you were just about to become an architect, what were the theories, what forces were there that maybe shaped you? Um, now I am too old to, 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 to give an answer about that. You could read my book and uh, maybe my Wikipedia page. Ja, mich hat eigentlich äh, der Beruf interessiert und ich habe ja schon in der Diskussion gesagt, dass ich keine Sprache für diesen Beruf hatte, dass ich aber das als genau wissen wollte, das heißt sprachlos, sprachlos war es. Und dann habe ich eben Rudolf Olschatti gekannt, das hat mein Physiklehrer mich zu ihm geschickt, weil er gewusst hat, ich wollte Architekt werden. Dann habe ich dort langsam begonnen, Dinge zu verstehen, aber ganz nur schrittweise. Nicht hochkomplizierte Dinge, ganz einfache Dinge. Und bei Josefsson habe ich dann andere, äh, äh, einen anderen Einfluss gehabt. Mit diesen äh, Gesprächen in den Museen über Bildhauerei, Literatur, Politik. Er war ja ein Flüchtling aus Deutschland, der dann in der Schweiz äh, 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 quasi so quasi nicht weggegangen ist mit seinem Visum, sondern in der Schweiz äh, geblieben ist, als er da auf seinem Weg war das Land Deutschland zu verlassen, von Italien wieder zurückzukehren, in, in, ist er in der Schweiz geblieben. 
Und diese, diese zwei älteren Menschen, meine Freunde und die ETH selbst, das war so ein Dreigespann und da habe ich sehr viel äh, Informationen bekommen und die Informationen, die waren sehr viel mehr, als ich überhaupt verstehen konnte, das ist klar. Aber man erinnert sich ja dann immer wieder nach einem Jahr oder zwei Jahren, ah, das hat er so gemeint und dann hat er so gemeint, weil Wissen nützt uns nichts und wir müssen etwas verstehen lernen. What uh, influenced me in this way was, uh, uh, I grew up in my grandma's, uh, grandpa's house uh, on a very low technological level. Uh, the water was outside and the toilet was outside and no real uh, central heating. But then in 62, uh, with my parents, I went up in a first high-rise building with 13 uh, uh, levels and uh, for this I was very proud of because it was a positive uh, uh, monument in this uh, in this 60s in the small town and uh, uh, it's not uh, it's not a few on architecture or city planning it's a few on on uh, urban landscape more or less because uh, This enormous view from the skyscrapers to the Alps was very impressive for me. <laughs> you know, uh, if I think of my um, formative years, they are uh, the result of a special, uh, very special condition because I lived under communism, and living under communism is a very special, uh, is a very special uh, experience. And it was difficult to resist uh, and not to be really contaminated by the, all the. Um, strange dimensions and unhuman dimensions of communism and um, what helped me very much was literature culture in general and of course i tried to understand architecture because i loved it very much when i was a student i was not going for the architectural uh, series because we always said If you only think in architectural terms, only architecture will come out, namely boring buildings. We were interested in the accompanying fields, philosophy, education, uh, the moon landing, the strategy of Cassius Clay, the, the Formula One racing car, the Getting um, rid of gravity was our goal in all of our uh, um, projects. No, because I think that the, the history of Vienna, we rejected when we were young very radically. Yeah? But it, it really imprints your way of thinking. This is my theory about the Baroque architecture of the Austrian. The, diagrammatic architecture of the Dutch guys, yeah? So we are, of course, related to the Baroque way of thinking, uh, namely, can you imagine you building a couple of tons of material, yeah? Like in the Karlskirche, and then paint it away by painting a heaven there, yeah? the sky there. So this is kind of abstruse, abstract, Uh, uh, way of defining space. I started to study in the 80s when the, when the position of architects was really terrible. In fact, nobody was building anything. There was a big crisis uh, as well. And uh, at the university, we were taught a lot of modernist, uh, early modernist uh, architecture. We were also trained a lot in making analyses to a point uh, where we sometimes, uh, in our projects that lasted eight weeks, made six weeks of analysis and then in the last two weeks like, oh my God, I also have to make a design. Uh, and during the course of time, we discovered a library. I mean, all of us, all the students, we started to read the books and, but especially the magazines and we discovered what happened after modernism and what was going on in the world. I think subconsciously we were 
influenced by this sort of societal approach that the early modernists had. They really had a vision on their society, which was changing rapidly. They tried to con create more equal conditions for everybody. They were also very interested in creating new topologies. And at some point, people like Rem Kohlhaas, uh, Hadid, deconstructivism merged in, in our education. And at the same time, we also all went to lectures by Hermann Herzberger, who gave a lecture every two, three months. And then we would all be sitting in the, in the auditorium listen, listening to a lecture on stairs, basically. So these structuralist, modernist, uh, and deconstructivist, contemporary, at that time contemporary influences all sort of worked on our brains. Yeah, I studied in Zagreb, actually, in uh, then Yugoslavia, and uh, the school there was kind of perpetuating uh, a sort of Zagreb school of architecture between two world wars, which was a sort of functionalist project. But main influences, if I may say, on my thinking and on my view on architecture, I received uh, by studying in Delft with Hermann Herzberger and Aldo van Eyck uh, in the 80s. And uh, this uh, uh, kind of uh, anarchistic uh, Dutch uh, structuralism, uh, if we could uh, uh, define uh, van Eyck and Herzberger in those terms, has been basically one uh, idea or one almost can say ideology of the changing, the radical modernism towards something which will be more connect with the users of architecture, with the people or children. It's always very good to, to, to change totally your context because you, it's because you discover some, another way of thinking, inventing, researching. But I think what is more important it is when you come back in your former in your country to see how the, what I learned there I can apply it in a different context and this is very interesting for me very important was I mean before I studied architecture I was into development work in Bangladesh and I had these two passions the development work and also architecture and I didn't know how to combine these two passions. And then there was this sentence of Dietmar Steiner coming that architecture is a very vital essence of life. And for me, that kind of was really bringing these two things together. It's not about any isms and shapes and forms and aesthetic theories. It's really about the essence of human needs. I was a development learner in Bangladesh before my studies of architecture. And... Um, yeah, it is, you know, every choice of a material, every choice of a building technology is ultimately defining who's getting the profit or who's benefiting of the process. So whenever you have a building budget, I'm trying to design in a way that the biggest part remains with people and not with the cement industry or the steel industry and so on. And through this architecture can really be a catalyst for, for a healthy society. In diesen jungen Jahren bin ich durch Europa gereist, während meinem Studium und nach meinem Studium und war erschrocken über, die moderne, über den modernen Städtebau und habe mir zutiefst geschworen, dass wenn ich jemals in diesem Bereich Städtebau tätig werden sollte, dann werde ich niemals so etwas bauen wie das, was ich in Frankfurt, in München, in Berlin gesehen habe als moderne Stadtplanung. Und das Schlimmste, Toulouse Le Mireille in Frankreich von den berühmten Architekten Candelis, Jossig und Woods äh, in die Welt gesetzt. Und schon erst recht nicht das, was Le Corbusier in die Welt gesetzt hat mit seinen Unités d'Habitation. Ich habe natürlich, so wie es jedem Jugendlichen erlaubt ist, in meinen ersten Projekten nach dem Studium alle Fehler gemacht, die man machen kann, so mit Mitte 20 bis Anfang 30. Nicht länger als zehn Jahre nach dem Studium. Da muss man zur Raison gekommen sein. Und das hat bei mir auch so lange gedauert. How much do you think that like the cities you lived in um, influenced you in urban qualities? By the end of my studies, I lived in Rotterdam, which was a very hard, tough town, I think, that was starting to reinvent itself through architecture also. Uh, uh, developing the, the south side of the river, there was a fantastic project, for example, by Aldo Rossi, 
completely imaginary, but still very evocative. Uh, also, Rem Kolhaas, uh, OMA, made a lot of fantastic schemes. Never built, but theoretically, they sort of said something about the future. And I, as an intern, as a, as a student, I worked in Barcelona, where young architects, after Franco died, started to revive the city through public spaces. I graduated uh, in 1990. In 1998, uh, 89, the wall fell. And somehow the 90s started with this sort of boost of optimism. There was a strong belief that young architects could be interesting. The Dutch government sort of gave a lot of funding and possibilities for young people to start. So in a strange way, uh, we could have this sort of kickstart uh, of our office uh, at that time. So we were, in a, in a way, also quite lucky. Ja, die, die Stadt Zürich hat, ist einfach Sitz der ETH Zürich und ich wollte an der ETH Architektur studieren. So bin ich in Zürich geblieben. Aber die Bildung, meine, meine wirkliche Bildung ist natürlich der sogenannte geografische Raum, den man so nebenbei Italien nennt. Das ist ein Hauptteil meiner Bildung. Und dann der Mittelmeerraum. Und das habe ich so oft besucht und schrittweise vielleicht Dinge erkannt in diesem Land, also von der Bearbeitung der Felder, bis, wie man Espresso trinkt, bis zu dem Beruf selbst. Ich bin in einem Ort aufgewachsen und bin auch dort zur Schule gegangen bis zum Abitur. Der Ort heißt Echternach und der wurde von während dem Krieg total zerstört und nach dem Krieg relativ schnell wieder aufgebaut. Und ich habe als Kind praktisch miterlebt, wie an jedem Haus eine Steinmetzbude stand, und der Steinmetz mit diesem typischen Klick, 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 Klick Geräusch die wunderschönsten Fensterumrahmungen gemacht hat, die Schlusssteine mit irgendwelchen äh, äh, floralen äh, Deko Dekors versehen hat. Mein Vater war Schneider, ich habe natürlich Schneidern gelernt. Ich habe mir, als ich studieren ging, selbst alle meine Hemden selbst genäht und habe meine Hosen selbst genäht. Well, Paris is a, is a good place, of course, but uh, urban qualities, what is urban qualities? today and um, because when when you have no job when you have no money when when you have no country urban quality is what it is another last question how much do you still let yourself influence nowadays how much do you change your views oh that, that never stops i think every time uh, yeah you walk through cities you read books you look at movies you listen to people uh, or read newspapers or whatever, uh, this influencing goes on. And nowadays I'm also lucky, of course, we have a big office now, we get a lot of commissions, and I, I also think I can sort of read a little bit what's going on through the type of commissions and the type of questions that clients ask us. Ja, die Inspiration, die, 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 wie soll ich sagen, die, die sucht man nicht, sondern man liegt im Bett, denkt, etwas oder man arbeitet oder raucht eine Zigarette und sieht etwas ganz unverhofft und plötzlich, auch wenn man es schon zehnmal vorher gesehen hat, plötzlich ist man bereit, es wirklich zu sehen. Uh, for me, the most influence and uh, is um, the transformation uh, um, about uh, the the reason to to produce architecture. And um, because uh, the, the field uh, about the architecture changed totally between the uh, uh, 70s and um, because the people working about, uh, and the 80s also, working about the history. It was a, a route about the process of the architecture. You, the, you analyze the, the district, uh, the history of the district, the history of the street, the history of the building, the history of the history, the history. But very quickly, this kind of uh, attitude and, uh, and information, if you want, and database about the historical uh, approach is not enough, doesn't work. And the geographical feeling change, and we switch a little bit from the history to, to the geography. Because the geographical approach is not only architecture, design, history. 
it's uh, also social uh, aesthetic is a uh, is a um, it's open process because you you don't speak only about the design it's the postmodernist design the deconstructivist design the design of i don't know the minimalist design and so on okay okay we design but it's it's not the end it's it's not a school with some rules it's a, a it's an open source. It's more difficult for the architect because the architect are not very courageous. I think the situation has to be, it's more and more urgent to change the situation. So it means that you, um, you build in your mind um, and you try to, to, to take with you all the references that are important in order to have more um, to feel more powerful in order to resist and to fight against these constraints. To constraints, it is to precisely why it is always about um, constraints, rules, regulations, um, and not about pleasure, happiness, life, freedom. So this question of freedom is extremely important. Or it is possible for an architect first to be free himself, secondly to try to give freedom for the buildings and the people that will live in his building. No, there are still some interesting architecture positions, interesting movements. For me, a moment is very interesting in architectural terms is uh, the new architecture which is coming from Flanders in Belgium. Um, I'm still interested in this bottom-up movement uh, and for me Anna Heringer is one of the heroes of the new architecture in a way because not only in, uh, in her architectural position it's, a more, it's also a position to world economics, society, politics etc. But on the other hand I have to say that I'm still interested in some brilliant uh, big uh, projects by the big architect so for me one of the big uh, most interesting monuments at the moment is the Elbphil Philharmonie in Hamburg by Herzog Demmerer. I think the human needs are not something that are changing much I mean yes they have, maybe have some different colors but I was always interested in the very basic things this is kind of um, of course, protection, a healthy environment, but not only, you know, the, the built, the building around you, but also, you know, that the society, the health, healthiness of the society, the stability of a society, and of course, also a healthy planet and a diversity as well as a way to participate in creating your own spaces. I think these are all, you know, the self-actualization, if you refer to Maslow, the, the hierarchy of needs. So these are very basic human needs that don't change just in, in a couple of years. In dem Alter ist, wird man ein bisschen steifer. Nicht nur, dass meine Knie wehtun, aber man wird ein bisschen vorsichtiger. Ich habe vor 20 Jahren noch Zeichnungen gemacht, die ich jetzt alle in Buchform veröffentliche und bin ganz erschrocken über meine Frechheit von damals. Aber so im Alter bin ich ruhiger geworden und bin eigentlich eher jetzt in dieser Phase wie Rodin und äh, beschränke mich auf einen innerlichen Ausdruck und nicht auf die formale Zersetzung des Körpers. This is a good question because uh, when you have a certain age, is, uh, it's a question you ask about yourself. And, um, one of my qualities, uh, if I can say this, I dare say this, is that I'm always open. I am ready to learn. And in my opinion, if you have this, you are saved somehow. You are saved because otherwise you can become, uh, well, stiff. Well, sometimes I'm, I worry, but things are generally beautiful in life and sometimes in architecture too. <laughs> As you have seen, there are many different ways of becoming an architect. For more Miss TV interviews, visit our Facebook page and our YouTube channel or your closest Miss station. Ciao, viel Spaß. Das war Mies.